majority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. Welcome to this special edition of New York Now, bringing you live coverage of Governor Kathy Hochul's State of the State Address. I'm David Lombardo, host of WCNY's The Capitol Press Room. And in a few minutes, we'll take you live to the Assembly Chamber at the Capitol, where Governor Hochul is scheduled to deliver her third State of the State Address. Make sure you stick around after the speech for analysis and insights from Chantel Smith, head of the New York practice for Tusk Strategies, and Morgan Hook, a managing director with SKDK. But before we hear from the governor, we're going to stay in the studio to set the scene for today's speech and consider what we might hear from Governor Hochul. Morgan, as someone who's had a hand in crafting one of these speeches uh, before from the governor's perspective, what is Governor Hochul hoping to accomplish with this speech? Uh, well, it's the same thing I think that any governor is looking to accomplish. The state of the state is meant to kick off the sort of policy agenda, the legislative session, and sort of set the tone for Albany for the next you know, three to six months, both uh, for the budget and then for the legislative agenda. So what she really wants to do with this speech is come out with some sort of bold vision for the state, right? And in individual public policies that she's going to be advocating for, yes, but also just a sort of general, this is the direction we're going to take things, demonstrating her leadership for the legislature to see, for the public to see, and, and again, just sort of setting that agenda for Albany. Um, this is the this is the fun part, right? The state of the state is uh, is where you get to be um, a bit, a uh, little bit of rhetorical flourish. Uh, uh, talk about your vision. It's nerd and prom it, for Albany lawmakers. Yeah, well, too. nerd. I think the nerd prom really is in two weeks with the, the budget, budget. Yeah. because that's Touché. where the the rubber hits the road, and that's especially in a year like this where it's going to be less fun. But today is supposed to be about big picture, um, talking about her vision. So, Chantel having worked for the Senate Democrats in a previous life, what is the legislature listening for? I think they're listening to see which ideas they have, previous, have previously championed for are incorporated in the state of state. Because a lot of times the governor may have new bold ideas, but then sometimes it's just ideas that have been hanging around the legislature for a while for whatever reason they weren't able to accomplish or much, you know, much attention wasn't placed on it. I think they are looking to see how she wants to set the tone for the year. That doesn't mean they'll follow her tone, but I think it's like, okay, let's see what the governor sets. It's a big, hefty book. I think it's like 181 pages. You know, as staff, you know, we used to, the state of state would come out, we'd read through it, write a memo summarizing it, but like Morgan said, the budget's like where the rubber hits the road, and that's where the deep analysis goes, because there's actually legislation to accompany, you know, the budget, where this is just like, these are my highlights. This is what I'd like to accomplish. I hope I accomplish it. I don't know. It's an election year, so we'll see. Right. The governor can only get so much done by herself. She needs the legislature to work with her to can't actually get... can't get much get... done unless it's an executive order. Exactly. So how would you that. describe, then, the relationship the governor has with the legislature heading into a new legislative session? Hmm. You know, I w her vetoes were interesting to me at the end of um, the at the end of December. You know, the campaign finance veto. I think that was a devastating blow to the legislature, and I think that was a bill that the legislature cared about. So I think that veto may hamper um, relations. You know, the governor had a statement. Her press secretary had a statement about how you know the bills were passed without review, without discussion. These bills, most of the bills get passed in January, in June, May and June. There's months where these bills are introduced in session. They go through the committee process. Some of them have had public hearings. Some of them are even repeat bills that have passed multiple times, multiple years. So I think that statement was kind of like a throwaway dig. Um, but everybody's professionals, you know, they say new year new legislature governor. So hopefully, you know, the relationships will be good going in um, to this session, but it's tense because it's an election year. So there's going to be a lot of stuff Democrats as the left, they're going to want from the legislature. And then the governor has to, you know, she has to walk that tight rope. Morgan, does a state of the state address during an election year, as Chantel just put it, differ from what we might hear in odd years when the entire legislature is not up for the ballot, as well as this year, you know, not the governor, but the president? 
So I think it depends. I, I think, though, what Chantal is, uh, is saying here is she's actually hitting on something that's really important. Yes, this, the state of the state speech is about the governor's vision. Vision. Part of that vision, to her point, is what is my relationship going to be like with the legislature? So there is going to be a variety of things throughout this speech. Is she going to be giving credit to, to is she going to talk about campaign finance right. reform? Maybe that'll be the, the, maybe that'll be the peace offering and say, we need to go tackle this. And, and is she going to be giving credit to um, uh, public policies that the legislature has been advocating for? People in this room are going to pick up on those kinds of things. Now, for the most memorable state of the state speech that that I've been around was one that lasted about 15 minutes, and it was David Patterson walking out and just burning the building down and going to war with everybody and and attacking good government groups. And it was like during the the you know the midst of immediately after the Senate coup mm -hmm. and massive budget <coughs> deficits. That was a very different. He was he he didn't. There wasn't much of a vision there other than we're going to cut everything. Right. But the vision. But it was also setting a tone. It was like we are not going to be working together. <laughs> now, I don't think that Kathy Hochul wants to do that or is going to do that today, but it, it is one of these things, to your point, like, yeah. we're going to be watching for that today. How is she going to be, uh, how is she going to set the tone about working with the legislature, which she needs to work with, mm -hmm. to get anything done? So we've been talking primarily uh, about this state, the state address as a prospective speech. But in addition to talking about her 2024 agenda, she's going to talk about what they've accomplished in, in 2023. This is her big platform to trumpet things that have gotten done in New York State. Morgan, you're a PR expert. What would or should uh, the governor focus on in her speech? In 2023, she talked about public safety, affordability, and opportunity. Should she try to highlight wins in that area? Or what should she be promoting from 2023? Um, well, I, so I definitely think she's, there's always some throwback to that, right? And, it, and it's actually, I think we saw with Andrew Cuomo that, uh, for example, he would be talking about wins from two, three, four, <laughs> five years ago, mm -hmm. wins from his dad from like two decades ago. Like there was never a shortage of bringing up your greatest hits. How about those 61 the Yankees? <laughs> Weren't they great? <laughs> so um, that's absolutely something that a governor will do. And I, and I do think that that'll be there. I don't know. For me, usually when I watch these speeches, I, I, it's kind of like, all right, right. Mm -hmm. Let's get to you're you're setting up. You talk about the previous victories to set up something else. Although I will say, I have also seen speeches where, and again, this is going to be a tough budget year. So there's mm -hmm. not going to be the opportunity to spend a billion dollars for SUNY, for example. Mm -hmm. Boom. So. In a tough budget year, when you can't roll out some big expensive policy proposal, maybe you spend more time in this speech talking about your previous victories because you gotta fill the time a little bit. Um, what is she gonna highlight? I mean, I think she will highlight um, some reforms that have been done in the past, so maybe some higher ed victories. Uh, but again, like that's kind of not what I'm paying attention to when I go into the, you expect to hear it, but uh, I don't think that'll be the focus today. And right now in the assembly chamber, they're starting to get the proceedings underway with Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, who's going to introduce Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado, and that's going to kick off a whole array of pomp and circumstance. But Chantel Morgan mentioned the budget, mm. uh, and that's going to be where the rubber meets the road in Albany. And in terms of setting the scene, in the fall, state budget officials projected a four plus billion dollar deficit. So how is that going to constrain uh, the governor moving forward? I want to say this is going to be the first year that the new Senate. Democrats and the, the Assembly Democrats have dealt with deficits before. They've been in control forever. But this is the first time the Senate Democrats will deal with a real substantial deficit since taking power. When COVID happened, we got a lot of federal money. Mm -hmm. So you don't realize that we were actually in the hole by billions of dollars, but thank God for the federal spending. So now there's no more federal spending. The federal spending's gone, the federal money is gone, and they're gonna have to make cuts. I remember in 2019. Maybe they had like a million or two million. They had like a small number to play around. And members were pissed off. So like when there's no money and, you know, I, I'm interested to see if they tax the rich, if that's something um, that comes up because there's no money. And people don't want services cut. So if you can't cut, you got to find revenue generators. And in this year, on an election year, Everybody's going to want something, and it's going to be very interesting how they navigate this because nothing makes people crazier than deficits and cutting programs. Like you see how the city, New York City, is dealing right now. Like Eric Adams is getting killed for the cuts that he's proposing. 
the governor and the legislature, they're going to have the same problem. It's going to be bad. And you mentioned that the state of the state proposal that we've seen is about 180 pages long, yeah. but it is light on actual details. We will get those details yeah. right next week. That's right. where the real information and holes are filled with mm -hmm. the state budget, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's just going to be pages and pages, and it's going to be either a reduction of staff or reduction of programs, elimination of programs. Maybe there's new ways to figure out revenue, but, you know, the governor has been pretty, I think, adamant. She doesn't want to tax yeah. the rich. She doesn't want to do taxing. So I just don't see this being a bold financial year for the legislature. More policy, but then you have, a, you know, last year the, the budget was late, so... How much Monthly. policy? Yeah, how much policy can you get during the budget? But if you look at the but the session calendar, they take a break in mid-April. Mm -hmm. So I think they acknowledge that the budget's going to be late, and that'll probably go past the April first deadline, and they'll probably finish the budget maybe mid-April. But if you look at the calendar, because I, you know, I had I had to got to plan those vacations. <laughs> 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 so, so, Morgan, is it safe to assume the governor is going to avoid politically sensitive topics? I mean, are, should we see her lean into talking about asylum seekers? Is she going to want to talk about I, the botched marijuana recreational rollout? I don't think she's going to want to talk about uh, 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 the migrant crisis at all. Because she's got no solutions for, for that, right? That's, this is, that's largely a federal problem, and there's also no money in the state coffers. I, I do want to mention, though, I do think that there is... There is incentive, or maybe not incentive is the right word, but there's pressure on the legislature this year as well for some things that have nothing to do with what we're going to hear today, uh, namely redrawing the maps. Mm -hmm. um, the New York lines. is, right, the congressional lines, especially for these congressional districts. Um, New York State Democrats and the legislature got a lot of heat two years ago with what happened in the courts and the, and the original maps being thrown out. Um, the state lost Democratic seats in Congress. There are a lot of people who believe that Democrats could win back Congress in New York State alone if, like, the maps are done well, right? Mm -hmm. And what do we mean by well? If they're gerrymandered to the point where they're not going to be thrown out by the courts, but just enough so that we can win a few more seats, right? And that's let's, in favor of Democrats. Yeah, let, let's just be clear about right. what I mean there. <laughs> so if they're done well, um, that's a lot of pressure on this legislature to get that done and to get it done right, right? Like, however you feel about what happened the last time around, I thought that was a dubious court decision myself, but that was the court decision and it influenced the maps, right? So I, I, I also think because of those races, and also, and I give a lot of credit to both of the leaders in, in the Assembly and the Senate, they're always gonna be thinking about their marginal mm -hmm. members, right? So you have, you'll have certain members in both houses that are gonna be very outspoken, and mm -hmm. we absolutely need this, and then you always have those members, those 10 to 15 members, mm -hmm. depending on the house, they don't say much of anything, because you know, there might be a policy that they know is gonna be popular with the bulk of the caucus, but they can't pass it in the suburbs, mm -hmm. right? And so that's where the leaders really step forward, and they take the bullets, and they <laughs> say, we're not gonna, I'm just not bringing this to the floor, and then they yeah. take the heat. We've seen that year after year. Um, I think there could be a lot of that this year, right? There could be things that the city delegation is gonna be really strongly advocating for, and you're not gonna hear a peep in the Hudson Valley or on Long Island about it, because they wanna win those races in November. They're worried about what's gonna happen in Congress. And none of that has anything to do with Kathy Hochul. I mean, other than the fact that she's the leader of the party, and she's got to, like, set the tone in that regard, too. <laughs> she doesn't want to, and part of this is, goes to what your point about, like, yeah. working with the legislature. She's not going to want to jam them and create some sort of headache that will come back to haunt them in November. So I don't expect her to do something like that unless it's, you know, with a, that big eye towards how can we best position ourselves for November elections. I think this is just a year everyone needs to work together. I don't care who hates who. I don't care, like... Even if you have the best lines, you need a state party and a state apparatus to help the Democrats win these races so Hakeem can be the speaker of, yeah. of, of, you know, of the House. And it's Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Yes. So, like, the legislature, the governor, you know, everybody, state party, even, like, you know, congressional members, everyone has a part to play this election cycle. You're right. It has nothing to do with Governor Hochul. Like, it's not... All her burden, right. but she is the head of the state, so it should be her burden if she wants to show strong leadership. Yeah, because we know previous people would be all over this. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
We identified two areas where the governor is unlikely to want to spend a lot of time, uh, the cannabis rollout as well as uh, the asylum seeker uh, crisis. What about housing? This was a no. major area for the governor in 2023, Chantel. She was unable to accomplish what she wanted to do legislatively. We saw some executive actions that had some effect around the margins. Does she come back in a meaningful way in this speech, or do you think her pitch is, hey, we still have a housing problem. If you guys want to work with me, I'm here. I think she's. I think what she did was she tried with the legislature. It didn't work out. I think, hopefully, you know, cooler heads will prevail and there'll actually be a package sometime this year. But I think she's already doing something. She's, she basically, I think in her book is saying, review every state land and let's put affordable housing on state property. She did this with Creedmoor recently. I think there's the Kingsborough project in New York City. So she's trying to find alternatives and I have to give her credit because at least she's saying, you know, she's saying the legislature, they don't wanna work with me, so let me do something. But they have to work together to figure this out because even if she does the state stuff, it's not going to be enough for housing. And to Morgan's point, this seems to be one of those issues where there's a recognition that what New York City wants might be different from what the New York City oh, suburbs yeah. want. Yeah. And we're expecting that the governor is going to have housing proposals that are sort of New York City specific, whether it's a tax credit, whether it's letting New York City change its density, whether it's letting New York City uh, address accessory dwelling units as opposed mm -hmm. to making those types of programs statewide. Safe to assume that type of thing moves better in the legislature? I'm, I, what's the point of having these, bu these bills have been on the books forever. And if she's gonna give power to New York City to do its housing, if she's gonna concede from the legislature to New York City, I don't see it happening, because Albany likes to be the center of New York. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna concede power to the city council, who, you know, for whatever reason, they have their views on how the city council is. So I don't see it happening, but if she's, I don't think the governor, I could be wrong, I don't see the governor being the one to push out the housing. I think she's going to wait for the legislature to come to her and try to figure it out. Because in her mind, she had a progressive housing package last year, and they weren't interested. Well, speaking of New York City, uh, we know that New York City Mayor Eric Adams is actually in Albany for the speech and, and is planning to meet uh, today with Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. Mm -hmm. We expect him to meet with the Assembly Speaker as well, probably talk to the media. And right now, uh, in terms of the coverage uh, for the State of the State, we're seeing Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado at the dais. He is flanked by Senate Majority Leader <laughs> Andrea Stewart-Cousins, New York State Attorney General Letitia James, <coughs> uh, Albany stalwart uh, State Comptroller Tom DiNapoli, who is the longest serving uh, statewide official right now, and Assembly Speaker uh, Carl Hasty. They're going to be going through a bunch of the dignitaries that are in the room right now, including members of the uh, State Court of Appeals and some of uh, the governor's top staff and members of the congressional delegation. Morgan, for most people, this speech is not a major part of their lives. <laughs> I hate to break it to myself and everyone I else here. I would say it's like you know. 95% of New York it does not be a New I know, and for the people who are watching, thank you so much. <laughs> but for everyone else, how are they gonna consume this speech? How does this actually trickle down to the majority of New Yorkers? Uh, I, do think, I do think that there is an understanding that something major is happening in Albany today, right? Uh, uh, because yes, most people are not gonna be tuning in and you know, sort of building their week around like, like we do in Albany. Mm -hmm. But it will be the thing that leads every six o'clock newscast tonight, and it'll be the lead at every 11 o'clock newscast from every, you know, from Buffalo to Albany and in New York City. They're gonna see some sound bite, right? There's gonna see something that happened in Albany today, and they're gonna hear sort of a summary on it. So I do think, you know, when we think about this, when you're planning these things, like what is, you try to identify what's gonna be the one big takeaway from this. And that's why I talked to, to kick it all off, like what tone is she gonna set? What is, is there gonna be some specific policy thing that's gonna hop out? Maybe it'll be the swimming pools. <laughs> That'll hop out and that will lead the newscast. You kinda hope it's not the swimming pool, right? You kinda <laughs> hope it's, I, I'm not kidding. You, you kind of hope it's something visionary. You kind of hope it's, she's, Old. you know, like that first thing out of her mouth and she says the state of New York is what? Um, you want that to be, you want that to be the, the soundbite that leads the six o'clock news. So I absolutely think they're thinking about that. But by the way, 
advocates are flooding into Albany right now. Mm -hmm. There are legislators who want to make a name for themselves who are going to probably going to hold some sort of press conference or press avail. They want their quote to be the lead tonight on the 6 o'clock news as well. So I actually don't see that happening today. I kind of think that whatever the governor says will probably be <coughs> that, that sort of lead thing. Um, I don't know what that will be. But New Yorkers are going to hear about this speech today in some form or another, tonight or tomorrow. Um, and that's, that's the last time they're going to hear about Albany until the budget passes, probably, for a lot of them. But it'll get in their heads. And for viewers, the a pool reference that Morgan was making to <laughs> has to do with one of the governor's pre-State of the State proposals, uh, which is basically increasing access uh, to swimming pools, which is <laughs> obviously a cool. meaningful thing for yeah. people. But when we think about State of the State addresses, as you guys have talked about, historically these are bold uh, ideas. And, and the governor, in fact, you know, with her first pre-State of the State proposals, led off with this idea uh, of a lot of kitchen table things. These were pocketbook issues. These were insulin uh, caps on copay for insulin, hey, hey, hey. Which, someone type on diabetes, right, which has I a meaningful that. impact on people's that. lives. There was also stuff the with reading, yeah, the reading education. impacts people's lives. Yeah. But you know, sticking with the pocketbook issues, there was uh, limits on medical debt lawsuits. Uh, there was issues with unfair and deceptive business practices. Things that I think actually translate to meaningful policies for people. Maybe that's the goal. Like maybe it's not the bold stuff. Maybe it's the things that everyday people care about. Like maybe you know they always say like all politics is local, or people care about the things that impact them the most. So maybe it's about your kid, you know, being able to read or be able to pronounce words. Maybe it is about the things that we think are trivial, but like really, really impact everyday New Yorkers. And if that's the way she's going, I applaud her because maybe that's, you know, Previous governors would always do these bold transformations, but you never saw it until years later. I mean, even Kathy Hochul, two years ago, one yeah. of the proposals I remember, she said, we're going to make SUNY the best university system in the, in the world. Right. I, I, look, I love SUNY. That costs a lot of money, yeah. right? And two years later, we're not, she's not going to say that today. Um, and I point that out only to, to I agree with you. Like, yeah. sometimes it's the little things that actually yeah. will impact someone's life in a, in a very positive way. And it's something that government can do. Sometimes we get bogged down when we're talking about investing a billion dollars on whatever it might be. There, you get into infighting mm -hmm. with the legislature and how are we going to spend it and where's it going to go to? And so those, those things can't be realized as easily as a reading program. Right. Or... Uh, making insulin more available to people who need it. And those are important things that can actually impact someone's life. Right. And what actually stands out from that 2022 State of the State address is the governor going, you know, like, cheers, we're all going to have uh, drinks to go, everybody. Well, I mean, <laughs> that was what actually resonated with people. That yeah. was what they took away. That's what got memified. It wasn't yeah. the idea that we're going to rebuild higher well, education. the alcohol laws were very archaic at that time, so I'm very happy <laughs> she... Well, and I, I anticipate she'll want to take another stab at those again, but yeah. that also speaks to the challenge of actually moving something through yeah. the legislature. And when you think about this governor, Chantel, is she someone who can accomplish meaningful reform in an area like the state's blue laws, where the legislature sometimes is loath to wade in because there are so many it's, stakeholders it's so who have you know interest and it's very competitive and you have to go pretty quickly because Lieutenant Del Governor Delgado is up there, which suggests to me we're going to see Governor Hochul quickly or potentially a promotional video. But uh, until then, <laughs> tell us about how tough it is in the legislature. I think it's tough in the legislature because the legislature believes that legislation comes from them and not the governor. They right. set the tone, they pass the bills. I remember during COVID, like, you realize how archaic some of the alcohol laws were and you wanted to change it. Oh, that's cute. You wanted to change it. That's Nathan it. Rogers, <laughs> a fourth grade student from uh, Waterville Elementary School who's leading uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Nathan met uh, Governor Hochul last week when she uh, began to push her, uh, quote unquote, back to basics reading plan that uh, we mentioned uh, earlier as part of her pre-State of the State address. And up next is going to be actually this uh, promotional video that Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado is promoting. This is a uh, Our New York, uh, Our Future, which is going to do some of those highlights. Oh. But uh, I apologize for no, interrupting no, you, no. Chantel. Is, he was is, cuter than us. I, I mean, he was <laughs> adorable. And I was just, I love little kids. Anyways, but it's going to be very hard. The legislature, I remember this, there's constantly this, you know, push and pull about, you know, governors wanting legislation passed, but the legislature having their own ideas, mm -hmm. you know. They've already had their retreats. They know what they want to do for the first six weeks until the budget's done. They have the ideas of the types of legislations they want to work on. Policy takes a long time to negotiate. Yeah. What people don't realize is 
the governor will do her budget in, two, in like a week or two. Yeah. And then there'll be these public hearings. And basically from March until April 1st, whenever this budget is done, first the houses have to do their one house bills, which is just basically saying these are our priorities. Mm -hmm. The budget is usually negotiated in three weeks. It is a lot of long days and nights, a lot of no sleep. And like when you're trying to do policy, commas, and, ors, words matter. And it's not easy like, oh, here's this complicated thing. You guys can figure it out in two to three weeks. It's very hard to get people to move on their positions. Maybe you can set the tone for post-budget and continue having those discussions. But I think because there's no money, my I would just balance the budget. And then if there's complicated you know, legislation like housing or even the blue laws, do that from, you know, continue those discussions on to the end of session. Because if you're putting that all in the budget in a year where there's no money and people are pissed off, you're not going to get anything done. Like, I've seen it. When people don't have resources, usually when you have resources, that's how you get members to come around on policy and things like that. Oh, you're against this bill. Let me see if I can get something passed in your community. Let me see if I can get some extra money for this. There is no money. So I don't see how during the budget will be the time to really do much hard policy. I don't know. And this is not a governor, because as you mentioned, last year we were late, a yeah. month late or so, or maybe. Yeah, about a month late. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is not a governor who, in her first few years of office, has used the powers of, I'm going to jam this budget down your throat on April 1st, and if you don't pass it, we're going to shut the government down. Like, in that's terms of just, sending extenders yes, to the budget uh, with her budget. That's right a power that the executive has in New York, and she's made it pretty clear, I think to her credit, frankly, that's not really how she wants to negotiate things, right? She actually, last year, part of the reason I think it was, it was late is because they were having an honest negotiation, right? They weren't, it wasn't uh, scare tactics and threats. It was, we're going to work on this. And if we, if it comes in a month late, it comes in a month late. What's the big deal? Um, which I think to some extent is accurate, right? Like, yeah. again, we talk about what does the public actually and I think after 10 years of, we got the budget done on time, even the years they didn't actually get the budget done on time, um, it, having it be a little bit late because they weren't ready to pass a budget, that was okay. We saw that last year. So um, I think you're right. Like, there's a good chance it'll be late again this year. And if that means getting a better budget, then I think that that's fine. It could contribute, though, to a dysfunction narrative that really dominated Albany back in 2009, 2010. Whoa, 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 whoa. As someone that worked in the legislature 2009. I wasn't casting blame. I'm just saying there was a lot of dysfunction generally. In yeah. 2009, the MTA imploded. We were in financial ruins. There were a lot of things contributing to the quote-unquote dysfunction of Albany. I just I, want to state that. I, yes, I, but I do also think that the budget being late became a, uh, a symbol of Albany dysfunction writ large. Mm -hmm. And so every time the budget was late, it was just like, well, there they go again, right? So I think I do, you know, uh, the powers, that the Andrew Cuomo being able to use those powers to some extent and for them to be able to say we got however yeah. many budgets he pretended he got on time, even if they were a couple days late, it, it sort of dispelled with that symbol of dysfunction. And I don't think it applies anymore because right. it, hasn't, it hasn't been part of the Albany discussion in a decade. And so I don't think people hear late budget and immediately mm -hmm. assume Albany dysfunction anymore. That's a good thing because now it takes that sort of arbitrary, sorry, it's constitutional, but arbitrary deadline to get the thing done. <laughs> <laughs> it takes it off the table because it's less about a, uh, 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 how the public reacts to it. And it's more about like, here's this deadline that we've got. We can work around it and continue negotiations. There was real pressure before to, for people to get it done on time. I just want to fact check you. 2009 and 10, it wasn't the first time the budget was really late. No, like correct. Shelley and you know Dean oh. Skelos and Bruno, they had late budgets, but people don't talk about that. They only talk about nine and ten. I don't. Did Pataki ever have a on time you. budget? Like there were budgets passed in like <laughs> Mario, August. Right, Mario Cuomo like said he that. couldn't run for uh, exactly. president because so, he had to stick around with those so, late budgets. I just want to, you know, as a as a dem, you know, it's always gotta. <laughs> I appreciate that history lesson, Chantal. <laughs> you know. Morgan, we talked, though, about how then a dysfunction touched on, on everyone, even the people who weren't, as Chantel put it, you know, responsible for it. So 
sticking with that idea, is there a likelihood that whatever happens during this Albany session is going to frame or shape the debate around those congressional races that you talked about? For example, you know, Tom Suozzi on Long Island, his mm -hmm. effort to switch uh, the George Santos seat or some of the races in the Hudson Valley. Are, are Democrats going to have to run from what's happening here so in Albany? That's, and that's kind of what I was referring to earlier. I think they need to be careful about that, mm -hmm. right? They need to be careful about, I do think that they're gonna to need to get something done on housing. I think that the governor wants to get something done on housing. There are certain members of the legislature who need to get something done on housing. What that looks like, who knows? But part of the issue is, is you don't wanna do something that's gonna make that Swazi race uncomfortable or something in the Hudson Valley like that, that goes and becomes more of a, of a, of a difficult, uh, thing to talk about for congressional races or Senate races in the suburbs. Uh, so I absolutely think they're going to be thinking about how do we, you know, we want to get stuff done. We mm -hmm. want to do reforms. We want to uh, fix the blue laws. Mm -hmm. That's always going to be popular. <laughs> um, but how do you do it in a way that's not going to have the, because the thing that might be really popular in the five boroughs mm -hmm. might be really unpopular in, <coughs> on Long Island. Where the right? seats are actually up for right. grabs. So I do think there's absolutely going to be consideration about what is it we're going to bring forward, what is it we're going to fight for and get passed. And it's going to, there's going to be a thought in the back of the head that's how is this going to impact those races. And right now we're seeing Governor Kathy Hochul uh, enter the assembly chamber. She's being led uh, by the long-term, long-time assembly sergeant at arms, uh, <laughs> uh, who we just call Wayne. Um, and now she's uh, visiting and saying hello to some of the dignitaries. We see former Governor David Patterson. Uh, she just shook hands with. Uh, she's walking into where the assembly members seat. There is uh, Tom O'Mara. She just shook hands with the Republican from the Southern Tier. And, uh, you know, a lot of smiles. People aren't necessarily mugging to get a camera shot with her, <laughs> but she's getting a hug from what looks like, uh, I'm guessing, Tim Kennedy yeah, from Tim behind, Kennedy, who's yeah. uh, running for Congress out in Buffalo uh, this year for a special election. Uh, the governor is getting a another mm -hmm. hug from, is that Luis Sepulveda? Luis Sepulveda. Yep, meeting with some Senate Republican, Pat Gallivan. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be taking you to the governor's speech in a second as she ascends the dais. But we want to remind everyone that they should uh, stick with us after the governor's uh, done talking. And we're going to have more uh, analysis on what the governor actually said Ooh. and what it all means with uh, Chantel Smith of Tusk Strategies and Morgan Hook of SKDK. Uh, there we see the governor talking with uh, Rowan Wilson, yeah. who is the new chief judge for the state's top court. Uh, he was uh, appointed by uh, Governor Hochul after her first effort to fill the seat with uh, Judge Hector LaSalle was uh, blown up uh, was by blown up, the yeah. Senate Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a big deal here in Albany. And uh, the speech is about to begin, so I think we're going to say goodbye from the studio, and uh, we're going to send you to the chamber uh, in Albany right now. And just a reminder, though, please uh, come back with us. Uh, we've got plenty of hopefully thoughtful and funny things to tell you. Thank you, and good afternoon. It's an honor to be back with you in this hallowed chamber, a place where since 1879, civic-minded New Yorkers have wrestled with everything from the Great Depression to world wars to the everyday issues that matter most to the millions of people who call New York our home. Generations of past leaders have shared the solemn responsibility of representing their citizens, and I'm honored to be joined by the leaders of today. First, let me thank our Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado. He has done an amazing job. So proud to have him at my side. I want to thank Senior Pastor Darius Pridgen for the beautiful invocation. And I look forward to seeing you perhaps this Sunday in church. Save me a seat. Uh, State Controller Tom DiNapoli, State Attorney General Tish James, Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, Assembly Speaker, you can applaud any one of them you want, <laughs> Assembly Member Carl Heasty, <laughs> or I'm going back to the Majority Leader, Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. Okay.
Women have to look out for women, okay. <laughs> uh, speaking of powerful women, Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes. Great point. Yeah. Senate Minority Leader Robert Ort, again, another Western New Yorker. Yeah. Assembly Minority Leader Will Barkley. The esteemed judges of the New York Court of Appeals. New York City Mayor Eric Adams. Mayors and county executives from all across the state. And we're also joined by, yes, give them applause, former governors David Patterson and George Pataki. Also, many representatives from labor, distinguished guests, and clergy leaders, including Dr. A.R. Bernard, who is the president of our Executive Interfaith Council. <laughs> Members of my cabinet, Secretary Karen Persichilli Keogh and Council Liz Fine, and a special tribute to my policy director, the visionary behind many of our great ideas, Michael Lasher. But today is not about us. It's about the 20 million hardworking New Yorkers we are privileged to represent and what we can deliver for them in the year ahead. Now, I've listened as New Yorkers have told me about the challenges they face and the dreams they hold. And it's with them in mind that I proudly share my vision for 2024. The state of New York is strong, stronger today than when I became governor two years ago. It's healthier, safer, more affordable. Now, we've traversed some rocky terrain, and there's still some switchbacks before we reach this summit. Across our nation and our state, people worry that a safe and affordable life is somehow out of reach. While shootings and murders have declined by double digits, safety at the grocery store, the synagogue, or the subway is always top of mind. And although we've made great strides to take guns off the streets, too many parents are still fearful as their children get on the bus each morning. And too often, troubled individuals are discharged from the hospital without receiving the care they need and go on to commit violent acts. The potential of a crime, no matter how serious, is causing anxiety for our residents. And on top of that, they're also frustrated with the rising cost of living. Inflation is down 9.1% to 3.1% over the last 18 months. Paychecks are finally growing, and yet, our neighbors are struggling to make a dollar go further. And sadly, no matter how hard they work, they fear they'll never be as successful or get as far as their own parents did. These are the reasons that I fight every day, to give New Yorkers a better shot at a better life. And since taking office, I've worked with this legislature to create more than 600,000 jobs and reduce unemployment from 7.4% to 4%. And we did that while holding the line on taxes across the board, and in fact, we cut them for the middle class. We, we boosted K-12 education by $5.3 billion, an extraordinary 18% increase. And we fully funded foundation aid for the very first time in history. We increased health care funding by 20% to more than $112 billion, and we gave $1.3 billion in raises to our hardworking home health care aides and bonuses for health care workers, because they deserved it. 
And just this morning, as a result of our hard work with President Biden and his administration, we'll be able to invest over $6 billion in federal funds into our health care system over the next three years. This funding will help support our safety net hospitals, address health care workforce shortages, strengthen access to primary and behavioral health care, all important primaries of all of us. And on top of that, over the last two years, we invested over $7 billion in child care. And, and at the same time, we saved the MTA from a looming fiscal cliff that threatened the economy of an entire region, while ridership grew by 435 million new riders. <laughs> and no administration and no legislature ever before has invested more money faster into our roads and bridges and public infrastructure to rebuild our state. And I'm grateful grateful for your continued partnership and for the leadership of our Majority Leader, Andre Stewart-Cousins, and Carl Heastie, our Speaker. We Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you. Now, we've worked hard to restore integrity and trust in government. And here's what I know. You'll always see more headlines about the handful of places we disagree. But the truth is, we are united united in our commitment to the people of this state. And together, we've already achieved so much. But standing here and reciting accomplishments is not what people want from their leaders. Now, we will continue to fight the right fights on their behalf and relentlessly pursue common sense ideas that lift up the people of this great state. Joining us today is Quentin Cologne Roosevelt. Quentin is the great, great, great grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, who took the oath of office to be president exactly 125 years ago in a place called Buffalo. At just 19 years old, Quentin is the youngest elected official in our nation's capital. Quentin, stand up. Oh. Thank you. A great future. I told him in public service runs in his veins, and we expect even more. But like Quentin, I too was inspired by the 33rd governor of New York. In fact, I quoted Teddy Roosevelt my very first day in office. I promise to always strive valiantly on behalf of New Yorkers and be the woman in the arena. And that's exactly what we've done. That's why I'm willing to take on the stubbornly persistent crimes like retail theft, domestic violence, and hate crimes. We're going to also revolutionize our mental health insurance structure so people actually get the help they need. And we'll be protecting your hard-earned money from bad actors and predatory lenders. And at the same time, we'll continue to build New York to a place that welcomes businesses, new and existing, small and large, family-owned and publicly traded. We'll keep driving the long-delayed infrastructure and public transit projects, like the Second Avenue subway extension, the Interborough Express, the I-81 Viaduct, the Kensington Expressway creating thousands and thousands of good-paying union jobs so our workers can support their families. And we'll fight for minimum wage workers because no one should labor 40 hours a week and still live below the poverty line. And we'll fight for our farmers threatened by extreme weather and workforce shortages. We'll fight for seniors trying to make ends meet on a fixed income. We'll fight for women balancing motherhood and careers. We'll fight for children just beginning their journey in life. And in so doing, we'll pursue the common good with common sense 
by seeking common ground. As, as we uphold these commitments, understand this. We cannot spend money we do not have. Pandemic funds from Washington have dried up. Inflation didn't just hit families, it hit state government operations as well. So it's up to all of us to make the hard yet necessary decisions and use taxpayer dollars creatively and responsibly. Now I'll discuss how I'll tackle some of the toughest fiscal issues like caring for migrants and a structural deficit in next week's budget speech. But right now, let's talk about how we provide a better life for New Yorkers, starting with the initiatives we already announced since the new year. Last year, infant deaths were up for the first time in 20 years, and black and brown women remain three to four times more likely to die in childbirth. I won't let this continue on my watch. We must ensure moms have healthy pregnancies. So I want to make New York the first state in the nation to offer prenatal leave. We must protect women from unnecessary surgeries that put them at risk. And we're also giving children the resources they need to live full, healthy, successful lives. And that starts with teaching them how to read. I say it's time to get rid of debunked curriculums in schools and get back to basics, using phonics and proven techniques that work. We're also promoting physical health and well-being by building pools in underserved areas and teaching people to swim. And I'm proud that Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado will lead a newly created Office of Service and civic engagement. He and his team will connect New Yorkers who want to give back, especially young people, to service opportunities all across the state. And this is just the start of our comprehensive agenda for New York in 2024. We'll protect the environment by planting 25 million trees, fund resiliency efforts, and expand solar access, and make sure our state meets our bold emission targets. We'll promote jobs in agriculture and invest in family-owned farms. We'll connect New Yorkers with disabilities to career opportunities and fund research into rare diseases like ALS that robs millions, like my own mother, of their vitality. While we address countless challenges with 204, yes, 204 policy initiatives in our 2024 Stay the State book, which I'm sure will find its way to your nightstands this evening, <laughs> today I'm going to just focus on a few key common sense items for our agenda. Fighting crime, fixing our mental health system, and protecting New Yorkers' hard-earned money. Now let's talk. Let's talk about crime. If government can't keep their citizens stay safe, then nothing else matters. Now last year, we reduced gun violence, bringing shootings down by a third all across the state. Murders are down 21% in New York City, 38% upstate. We made key revisions to ballot reform to make New York safer. We enacted gun control legislation that's a model for the rest of the nation. But certain types of crime have been stubbornly high. New Yorkers see it every day. Graffiti scrawled outside a synagogue. Baby formula locked behind plastic panels. A couple's argument turns violent and punctuated by gunshots. And on the subway, people suffering a mental breakdown or an overdose. Episodes like these can cause an atmosphere of anxiety in our communities. But our success in driving down gun violence proves that targeted strategies do work and that changing trends is indeed possible. 
So today we're unveiling a series of crime-fighting tactics alongside an era-defining mental health initiative. So New Yorkers can live free from chaos and disorder and focus on the things in life that matter most. First, we must ensure everyone is safe at home by protecting them from domestic violence. Now, the random attacks get all the press coverage, but New Yorkers are much more likely to be hurt by someone they know. In one third of assaults, the attacker and the victim have a prior relationship. Our system fails too many survivors. In New York City alone, 84% of domestic violence arrests end with dismissals. Think about that. And before last year, too many abusers had access to guns, so we changed the law. And now, <laughs> but now the Supreme Court is poised to possibly overturn a law that keeps guns away from the abusers. So we need to strengthen protections, and it's more urgent now than ever before. <laughs> you may have heard me talk about how my mother grew up in a home where domestic violence was routine. She dedicated her life to survivors to break the cycle of trauma. And we know that prosecuting violent abusers is the best way to protect survivors. Take the story of Elizabeth Beechard, who's here with us today. Elizabeth, please stand. <laughs> Elizabeth lives right across the river in Troy. Not long ago, she was trapped in an abusive relationship. She and her pets suffered regular abuse at the hands of her ex-boyfriend. He killed one of her kittens, maimed another, then one day her life changed. A veterinarian told her about Unity House, a nonprofit that helps survivors of domestic violence. Eventually, she met Troy Police Detective Russ Clements, who's also joined us. Detective Clements. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He helped Elizabeth find the strength to pursue justice and filed charges. He assisted her with police reports and stood by her side at the grand jury. With his support, Elizabeth has made a clean break from her abuser and is rebuilding her life. Let's give them both a round of applause. I want to hear more hopeful stories like this. And that's why we're dedicating $20 million so district attorneys can gather evidence to prosecute abusers and take their guns away. <laughs> and we're committing more funding so police can protect those most at risk of abuse and clamp down on repeat offenders, because every survivor should have the same chance to break the chain of violence and build a new life. Across our nation and our state, retail theft has surged, creating fear among the customers and the workers. Thieves brazenly tear items off the shelves and menace employees. Owners go broke replacing broken windows and stolen goods, driving many out of business. These attacks are nothing more than a breakdown of the social order. I say no more. The chaos must end. And for the very first time, we're launching a joint operation between federal, state, and local law enforcement, along with a brand new state police unit to crack down on organized retail theft. As I said, we used this approach with illegal guns, and it worked. I'm also proposing to help those business owners with a tax credit to help them cover the additional security costs. 
and I'll work with the legislature to strengthen penalties for assaulting a retail worker or fostering the sale of stolen goods online. Let's get it done. Let's back our businesses, back our businesses and the workers with the full force of the law and punish those who think they can break the rules with impunity. And this extends to the illegal cannabis vendors who flagrantly violate our laws. We'll empower localities to go after the unlicensed shops, prosecute businesses that sell to minors and padlock their doors faster. Finally, regarding crime, I want to talk about hate crimes, particularly the rising tide of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Since the horrific attacks by Hamas against Israel on October 7th, there's been roughly a 95% increase in hate crimes against Jewish residents of New York City. And we're seeing a surge of anti-Muslim hate crimes as well. Our neighbors are being targeted on playgrounds and synagogues and mosques and on college campuses. And I will not rest until every Jewish and Muslim child feels safe going to school or entering a house of worship. So we propose to make more than two dozen additional offenses from gang assaults to graffiti eligible for prosecution as hate crimes. This means enhanced liability, sentences, and ultimately, it means we're standing up for what's right. We'll protect the people of this state. We'll carry this fight until every New Yorker feels safe at home, at prayer, and at work. But no matter how much we spend on law enforcement or expand their powers, New Yorkers will not be able to let their guard down until we fix our mental health system. Because here's the truth. From Brooklyn to Buffalo, many New Yorkers are suffering. Mental illness doesn't discriminate. It touches the rich and the poor, reaches into schools and senior citizens with the senior centers with the same severity. Even our first responders are suffering. Their experiences on the job expose them to horrific circumstances. And the suicide rates among law enforcement are about 60% higher than the rest of the population. And too often, the people involved in violent incidences on our streets and our subways are victims themselves, victims of a system that failed to provide them the treatment they need. High quality care must be widely available, accessible, and affordable. Yet for decades, the mental health system was deprioritized and defunded. Over the 10 years before I took office, funding for mental health grew only by 2%, not even keeping up with inflation. The result, too few psychiatric beds, too few mental health practitioners, and failing support systems. Combine this, with pandemic isolation, opioid addiction, and the toxic algorithms that govern social media. It's no wonder we have such a serious problem on our hands. Make no mistake, this is the defining challenge of our time. And that's why my administration, working in partnership with this legislature, has already made unprecedented investments in mental health care a 33% increase just over the last two years. And we boosted funding by $1 billion last year alone. Now here's what this allows us to do. Target hundreds of millions of dollars toward outpatient community-based services, create more than 3,500 housing units for people suffering from mental illness, increase inpatient psychiatric beds by 1,000, and initiate sweeping measures to help our children, including millions for suicide prevention, eating disorder care, and school-based mental health clinics. You know, focusing on our kids, 
It's everything. It's critical because they're our most precious resource. And investing in mental health services for the young means they won't be relegated to a lifetime of needing care later on. When schools closed during the pandemic, kids turned to social media to stay connected with friends and family. But a darkness lives on those platforms. Content often promotes themes of sadness, alienation, even suicide. The algorithms that make social media so addictive push that darkness onto young users. I'm thinking about New Yorkers like Alex Spence, who grew up on Long Island. She joined Instagram when she was only 11 years old. And immediately, the algorithm started suggesting images and videos about eating disorders and, and themes promoting low self-worth. By the time she was 15, young Alex was spiraling. She was losing weight. She didn't sleep. Her life wasn't hers anymore. It belonged to the algorithm. After her parents intervened, and after two weeks in a psychiatric facility without her phone, she emerged a changed person, able to assert herself again. Today, she advocates for other young people at risk and dreams of the day of testifying before Congress about the dangers of social media. Be believe it or not, you're watching WMHT's coverage of Governor Kathy Hochul's 2024 State Alex of the State Address. The lucky ones. And her mother, Kathleen, is here with us today. Kathleen, please stand. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Here's what Kathleen says. Social media it's a silent killer of our children's generation. According to the CDC, one in four teens have considered suicide, double the figure just a decade ago. For teenage girls, the numbers is one in three. That's why we're going to tackle the scourge of social media that has harmed so many young minds. Attorney General James, the two of us together will continue demanding accountability from social media companies. We'll advance legislation to protect children's privacy and regulate the algorithms that target them on social media feeds. <laughs> we'll expand tier to support programs so kids can share safe spaces with other kids with the same challenges. In the meantime, we have to help the kids who are hurting right now. We'll start with historic investments to make mental health services available to every single school age child. <laughs> and ensure that every school that wants a mental health clinic will get one. And I'm glad to be joined today by another great New Yorker, Brianna Braverman. Brianna? Yeah. Brianna worked tirelessly. She's worked to support school-aged New Yorkers through a program called Youth Act, which enables young people wrestling with mental illness to stay in their schools and communities rather than receiving inpatient treatment. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you for all you're doing. So we're building on the progress she already made. Everyone can agree that healthy children are more likely to grow into healthy adults, but too many grow up without the support they need and pose a danger to themselves or others. That's why I'm proposing comprehensive reforms to our behavioral health system. Starting in 2024, we will require hospitals to screen patients with mental health conditions for risks like suicide, violence, substance abuse, and other complex needs. We will also require that follow-up psychiatric care be coordinated before patients can leave the hospital. It's common sense, but it hasn't been happening. And let's significantly expand mental health courts, which are proven to reduce recidivism. <laughs> Empower 
court-based mental health specialists are most vulnerable, so are most vulnerable get help, rather than just cycle in and out of the justice system. And as we know, the most extreme cases involve people committing violent crimes, often lacking the capacity to live safely on their own. Just two weeks ago, at Grand Central Station, one of those individuals pulled a knife and stabbed two young tourists. Thankfully, the injuries were not life-threatening. But episodes like this extract a vast psychological toll on our communities and everyone else. And just as that act of violence was absolutely abhorrent and inexcusable, so too were the repeated failures that allowed the perpetrator to slip through the cracks, diagnosed with numerous mental health conditions, including schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He had a history of terrorizing those he loved and falling into rageful, menacing episodes. He should have received help long ago. We can no longer wait for someone to lash out and hurt someone before we take action, because by then, it's already too late. And a relatively small number of people need the most intensive care. So we'll fund specialized housing to provide services to these individuals with a history of criminal justice involvement. We often know that also known to New Yorkers in crisis are discharged back into our communities, not because they've recovered, but because there's no more room in our hospitals. And that's why we're creating 200 best-in-class patient beds for those with the most serious needs. But mental health care is not just for those in crisis. Whether it's anxiety, depression, grief, addiction, we've all needed support at one time or another to get through the struggles of life. But seeing a therapist can be expensive, and some people can't afford out-of-pocket payment. And for too long, many insurance companies have refused to adequately pay for mental health support. That changes now. I want to increase, I want to increase reimbursement rates for all state licensed mental health services, and the new regulations will require insurers to pro provide out-of-network coverage when timely appointments are not available in network. So to enforce it, we'll give the Department of Financial Services more staff, more discretion to increase fines on insurers who flout the new rules. So I recommend you don't. This matters because we know when people don't get help, their struggles only become more intense. Addiction is the same. We've all seen lives in every corner of the state sapped by opioid dependence. My own family has been touched by this epidemic of pain. I still mourn the loss of my nephew and the millions of other lives needlessly cut short. And that's why we're harnessing over $200 million in settlement funds secured by our Attorney General James to, to bolster and support our workforce for addiction treatment professionals, to grow our street outreach efforts, distribute more naloxone, and millions more life-saving fentanyl test strips. You know, we're leading the nation in disbursement of these funds and spending them quicker than any other state. I envision a future where no parent ever again has to find their child lifeless and glassy-eyed on the floor. Where every New Yorker can feel safe walking the streets or taking the subway. And where our children have the every resource to become the best version of themselves. Protecting financial health of New Yorkers has to be a top priority for ours as well. We've worked hard together, the legislature and our administration, to make New York more affordable. Since I took office, we raised the minimum wage and tied it to inflation. We delivered tax relief and utility savings to millions of low and middle class New Yorkers. And we recruited world class companies, bringing their high paying jobs to New York. Last week, I detailed a 
series of actions to protect New Yorkers from cheats and scammers. So right now, I'm proposing the first significant change to our consumer protection laws in over 40 years. <laughs> We're going to prohibit unfair and abusive practices like student loan servicers pushing borrowers toward the most expensive repayment options and debt collectors who manipulate seniors into giving up their protected income. We'll establish regulations on the buy now, pay later loan industry, which often lures customers into spending beyond their means. And we're taking on medical debt and dramatically increasing paid disability leave. Because, <laughs> believe it or not, disability leave has not been raised a penny in 35 years. What's the point of paying for this benefit your whole life if it only gives you a fraction of what you need to recover? We have to right this wrong and increase this benefit from a paltry $170 a week, which is what people get right now, to bring it up where it would have been adjusted for inflation as much as $1,250. That's seven times more than it's been, and I say it's about time. <laughs> because we all know, any of us can be struck with an illness or a weightlifting mishap in the gym. It can happen at any moment. It's getting better. <laughs> you know, a ride in the ambulance or minor injury, surgery can lead to, lead to people's financial ruin. You've seen it. I've already signed some of your bills, and thank you. Scrubbing medical debt from credit reports, banning providers from garnishing wages, and now what we're going to do next. I'm proposing that we protect low-income New Yorkers from being sued by the medical debt that they cannot pay. And, and cap, cap monthly payments and interest and expand hospital financial assistance programs. You know, the cost of life-saving medicine also weighs down New Yorkers. Of the 1.6 million New Yorkers diagnosed with diabetes, many can't afford the insulin. One of them is Heather Whitney, who's needed insulin every day to survive for the last 32 years. Heather joins us today. Heather, please stand up. Thank you. She has spent her life managing her own disease while fighting on behalf of others so students don't have to ration their insulin when they go off to college. Seniors don't have to skip entire doses. And diabetic parents don't have to go without insulin to make sure their own sick child has what it needs. So thank you. Thank you for your advocacy on behalf of our citizens. So let's end that as well. I want a ban on co-pays for insulin for anyone in a state-regulated insurance ban. Because no one asks to become a diabetic, and they deserve our care and compassion. Now let's get to the most important issue when it comes to affordability. You ready? Okay. The obscenely high cost of rents and mortgages caused by the unconscionable shortage of housing in New York. You know, it's one of the, it's one of the forces driving people out of every corner of our state. And out-migration is a problem we need to talk about. For 50 years, we've been hemorrhaging families who no longer can raise their children in the same communities where they were born. And this decline shows, shows no, no sign of stopping. But here's what's so interesting. People aren't necessarily moving for warmer weather or lower taxes. Many are moving next door. Of the top five states that New Yorkers are moving to, three of them share our borders and have similar taxes. People are earning in New York, but living in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. We're losing population relative to other states. 
And what does that mean? It's a loss of influence. We went from 43 members of Congress when I was a little girl to just 26 today. But for decades, no elected official in New York had the political courage to even start a conversation about building more housing. Now, big cities around the nation, including our neighbors, showed ambition that dwarfed our own. From 2011 to 2020, Washington, D.C. developed 72 new housing units per 1,000 residents. Boston developed 47. New York City, thriving metropolis, place people want to be, only 27. And people want to be here. So until we address our housing shortage, many of our neighbors will continue to struggle financially. One year ago, I pushed what the New York Times described as the most ambitious housing plan since the Rockefeller administration in the 1960s. Unfortunately, many made it clear they would not support it. I knew you're we unlikely to win this fight overnight or even in one year. But this dire situation demanded immediate action and I didn't want to wait around for the next legislative session. We found innovative solutions using executive orders, freeing 5,500 units in Gowanus that have been languishing in limbo. We offered financial incentives that people had asked for, financial incentives for pro-housing communities that demonstrate a willingness to build. Today, I'm announcing a plan to expand on those efforts by developing on sites that are owned by state agencies, including former correctional facilities, areas near commuter rail stations, and under, underutilized SUNY properties. This initiative alone could create up to 15,000 new housing units. I know it's a good start, but it's not enough to fix our affordability crisis. So let's be honest with New Yorkers. The only thing that will solve this problem is building hundreds and hundreds of thousands of homes. <laughs> now, New York already spends more than any other state in our nation on housing. Our capital plan is the most ambitious in history deploying state and private dollars, adding up to $25 billion in funding. Now, what does that get us? Sounds like a lot of money, right? That results in 100,000 new and preserved units. Very important, but still a fraction of what we need. Here's what I know. Spending more money or insisting on new regulations will not get us out of the deep hole dug by decades of inaction or overcome the lack of courage to do simply what is required. Already, New York has vastly more regulated housing stock than any other state, but it still hasn't meant more homes for people. And that's where the status quo has failed. It's a Band-Aid when we need reconstructive surgery. So where does that leave us? We still need an effective statewide approach to encourage new construction. But in the meantime, there are aggressive actions we can and must take now. Now, I remember last year, member, many of the loudest voices in opposition said they believed in local control. OK, let's put that to the test. The city of New York, which is a local government, wants to build 500,000 more homes over a decade. I agree. Let them build. Our plan for New York City, our plan for New York City includes four components of what I proposed last year. Restoring tax incentives to build housing that includes affordable housing. Eliminating outdated restrictions on residential density that prevents the city from building more. 
supporting no-brainer ideas like the conversion of underutilized commercial property into homes. That can't be hard. And legalizing basement apartments where New Yorkers already live. Again, what we saw in every other state that met the challenge of building more housing, it took decades. But I approach this crisis with the sense of urgency that is required. So what are we waiting for? Let's unleash New York City's potential beginning this session. Do you agree with that, Mayor Adams? That's All right. So now is the time to act. New Yorkers are tired of waiting, I'm tired of waiting, and I know we can do this. It takes political will, it takes collaboration, and it takes a commitment to deliver what New Yorkers desperately want. And we, my friends, are up to the task because police officers, firefighters, nurses, and teachers should be able to live in the communities they serve. And our children and grandchildren should be able to one day build a life in the towns and cities where they grew up. And while building more homes is absolutely essential, it's also essential that we have good paying long-term jobs so people can provide for their families. Now, I know as an upstater who lived through decades of decline and job loss, there was a time when our greatest export was our children. I'm glad to report those days are finally over. But as a governor, I know it's hard to recruit new businesses. But if we're intentional, targeted, invest in our communities, our infrastructure, our education system, then we can beat out all the others, all the other states, and land incredible companies. I know we can do it, because that's how we attracted Micron with its 50,000 jobs and $100 billion of investment. <laughs> At the same time, we have to keep supporting our homegrown companies like Corning, IBM, Global Foundries, and countless others. But it's not just about jobs and tech. It's about the ripple effect when they come, the local construction jobs that are created, the restaurants, the small businesses that flourish as a result. Now, since taking office, I've been laser focused on developing industries of the future, like semiconductors across the state. But now, we have a unique and fleeting opportunity to catapult New York ahead of its competition. I propose nothing short of making New York the global leader in AI research and development, the leader for the nation, the leader for the world. Because our reputation across the globe has always been synonymous with boldness and innovation. So where else but New York should this be happening? AI is already the single most consequential technological commercial advancement since the invention of the internet. Global AI has already been valued at $100 billion just last year, and it's brand new. And it's projected to reach $1.3 trillion by 2030. Now, other states want it too, not to mention foreign powers like China. But whoever dominates the AI industry will dominate the next era of human history. The, that's what we can do here in New York. Those next generation supercomputers, they'll power AI, but they're currently in the hands of just a handful of private companies. Google, Meta, Microsoft, OpenAI. I'm proud to announce that New York will be the first place in the world to put the type of that type of computing power directly in the hands of leading academic institutions who've stepped up to participate. Cornell, NYU, Columbia, RPA, and our entire SUNY and CUNY systems.
We have geniuses at these schools just ready and poised to innovate and launch new companies. And now they'll have the power to change the world. Now, in order to win this race for the future, we need this specific hardware. And that's why I'm proposing the Empire AI Consortium to purchase and share AI computing power right here in New York. And we've already secured more than $125 million from philanthropic and university partners. And over the next decade, the state will commit up to $275 million to the, to the consortium. So you say, what's in this for New Yorkers? Well, just like Silicon Valley exploded in the 1980s, we, we will be the birthplace of countless new startups, spin-offs, and the technological advancements that benefit everyone. Just imagine the possibilities. AI can help diagnose cancer and cure diseases. It can predict dangerous storms so our communities have advanced flood warnings. We could use that today. Or uncover solutions for stubborn racial and economic disparities in our communities. That's something Holiday Sims, a senior at the University of Buffalo, who's with us here today, is already working on. Holiday? <laughs> Let me tell you what Holiday's doing. She's conducted research on how AI can improve the child welfare system. And she's passionate about increasing black women's participation in computer science. Holiday. Stand up again. <laughs> Thank you. Holiday and scholars like her in our universities will help build this industry of the future. And with this new consortium, we will drive ethical AI development and do it in a way that protects our workers and make it a force for good in the world. We'll be the very first to harness the power of the private sector, academia, and government to galvanize this industry. And as I said, we'll share this power and make it available to people like Holiday who are innovating for the good of society. That's how we change the world. Together, we can ensure our children grow up in a new cradle of innovation, a globally competitive AI-driven economy created right here in New York. This is my final message, direct to New Yorkers. You've heard promises before, and it's hard not to be cynical or feel overwhelmed by the swirl of chaos in our news feeds. The war in Israel and Gaza, white supremacists attacking our houses of worship and schools and grocery stores, unfettered theft at the local drugstore, on the stack of bills on the kitchen counter that never seems to go away. New Yorkers look at their bank accounts, wondering how they'll pay their rent or afford the insulin for their child to survive. Those nights of worry can be so long so dark. And I know in those moments, I can actually understand why some people feel the sun is setting on the Empire State. But I don't despair, because I see light on the horizon. We are a state where resiliency runs in our veins. No mountain is too high for us to summit. And you know what? Our strength is forged in the diversity in the industry of our people. We succeed because of our contrasts and our amazing differences, because we know we're more powerful together than on our own. You know, it's fascinating to me that our great state is home to the world's leading financial institutions, but also supports the tiny mom and pop shops that dart, dot the main streets of our tiniest villages. You know what I mean? New York is a living, breathing body 
with all of its flaws and imperfections, it's still an extraordinary and magnificent being. It's the creative minds that bring song and dance to Broadway and action to our screens. It's the strong backs of our proud manufacturing workers who make products sold around the world. It's the deft hands of the most gifted surgeons fighting cancer and saving lives. It's the strong shoulders of our hardworking farmers cultivating their fields and feeding our people. It's the nurturing spirit of our child care providers and teachers who care for our children. It's the concerned eyes of our health care workers striving to heal the sick and comfort the dying. And it's even the welcoming smile of bodega owners making a bacon, egg, and cheese in the morning. You know, they're good, I've had them. <laughs> Quoting the philosopher Taylor Swift, <laughs> she reminds us that everybody here was somebody else before. And although people might live fundamentally different lives, you know, they still stand side by side on the subway platform or sit at a counter in a diner upstate or Long Island. United as New Yorkers, we all want our great state to succeed. It also means lending a helping hand to those in need. Another one of my predecessors, FDR, said, the test of our progress is not whether we add to the abundance of the, to those who have much, it's whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Thank you. That's why. That's why we must lift more, lift more people into the middle class and give them the same opportunities that my own immigrant grandparents had and many of your parents and grandparents, even you. We don't want a New York that's a huge gulf between the rich and the poor. We want to build a bridge to the middle class and beyond. Today I've told you how we'll build that bridge in 2024. We're enacting a vision of New York where veterans can embark on incredible careers fighting climate crisis and green energy, offshore wind, where unions are strong and our infrastructure is resilient to withstand those 100-year storms, which where all children learn to read and swim, where children with disabilities have pathways to pursue their dreams, where our LGBTQ plus neighbors are free to be their true selves without discrimination, where we honor and support our First Nations communities, and where women know that I'll always fiercely protect their right to an abortion, as well as fair wages, freedom from domestic violence, sexual assault, and harassment. My friends, we will never compromise our progressive values as New Yorkers, because our New York is as powerful as Niagara Falls. It shines as brightly as the Montauk Lighthouse. Our New York stands as resolute as Lady Liberty, and our compassion runs as deep as glacier-carved Seneca Lake. In our state, we stand with New Yorkers, even on their darkest days. And we support all people to live their lives with optimism and hope. And if we, if we as leaders, fulfill our commitments and our promises, then this is the dawning of a new day. Welcome to our New York. Welcome to our future. Thank you.
and that was Governor Kathy Hochul, who just delivered her third State of the State address to a packed house in the Assembly Chamber at the Capitol. As we continue our special New York Now coverage of the governor's speech, we're going to discuss what we just heard, what we didn't hear, and how it will all impact this year's legislative session in Albany. To do that, we're joined in the studio by Chantel Smith, head of the New York practice for Tusk Strategies, and Morgan Hook, a managing director with SKDK. So Morgan, from a PR perspective, what stood out to you for this speech? What might resonate with New Yorkers? I thought you were going to ask me a different question, so I had a different answer, but I will, no, 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 I'm going to answer that question. Um, uh, taking a step back and, and, and watching that speech um, I, uh, from, from, my, uh, from my PR perspective, as you, as you said, um, it was kind of, uh, and we were talking about this a little bit, it was kind of, uh, depressing? Was kind of depressing and dour. I mean, she, she started off the speech saying, you know, the state of our state is strong and it's healthier than it's been before and it's safer than trying to say, like, look, things are actually not as, and this is true, by the way, of polling all over the country. Like, people are kind of down on the economy, even though there are signs that the economy is doing, actually doing pretty well. Crime, as she pointed out, is down, and yet people think things are less safe. Um, that, is, that is a real thing that people are feeling. So she, 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 I thought she was, when she started off and saying what she said about we're stronger and we're healthier and we're safer, I thought she was going to lean into that and try to be a little bit more, raise the spirits. Mm -hmm. It was almost like, it, 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 just like the whole tone of it felt very, like, heavy and 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 dour is the word I I have for this just like the room there wasn't a lot of energy yeah. there it felt like it wasn't like and she had been the governor the last two years it was kind of like I'm taking over from the previous no, no, person no, I, don't now. Even, I don't even mean it that no? way I mean it more like like it was almost like she was like listen I know things are bad but I promise they're gonna get better and it, and, I, and I, that's not the tone I expected. I expected more, listen, things are a lot better than you think and they're going to get even better. You know, like she wasn't, um, she wasn't as energized as I think, like almost like you want to rally people who might feel down. It's almost like mm -hmm. she, was, she was saying, yeah, you've got reason to feel down, and, but we're going we're gonna to start to turn it around. And that was, that was an odd tone, I felt like, because I do think there are things in here that they can get done, um, things that aren't going to cost a lot of money, I think. You know, they, she talked about reforming some of the gun laws related to domestic uh, violence. I think mm -hmm. that that'll have no problem getting that. That'll be a good uh, bill signing day for for the legislature and for the for the governor mm -hmm. on that. Um, you know, uh, uh, Medicaid, uh, medical debt, tightening consumer protections for people who have uh, medical debt. I think that that's something they can do. Any money they spend from settlement money that the attorney general's captured, I mean, like, that's an easy thing to spend money on. The health insurance mandates don't cost it, the state anything. Right. And, there's, and there are some others. There are some good mandates in here that, that I think she'll be able to get done. Um, but I just, like, it was just that was a very heavy speech, it felt like. And... Um, I was just a little surprised by the tone, I guess. Maybe she's using this speech to set the tone for the budget because the budget is going to be a little bit not what people have, have been experiencing for the past couple of the years. I mean, I think she was talking about inflation. She said, yeah, we got some, you know, New York still, you know, we increased jobs, we increased the minimum wage, but there's inflation, there's no more pandemic money. That is true. Maybe she's just... You know, sometimes I think state of the states are um, like Pollyannish, like, oh, New York's the best, mm. the number one, blah, blah. We're not. <laughs> like, we're not in some cases. And I felt that this was maybe a more realistic assessment of the current state. And I think she's tapping into how people are feeling. Because, yes, we may be up in terms of jobs, and yes, we may have certain things, but people are feeling pretty crummy right now. I do think it was heavy. But I think this is just a heavy time, and the legislature in Albany have a lot of responsibilities for the next six months that they have to really like deep, deeply dive into. Well, Chantel, Morgan mentioned some areas where the legislature oh. and governor <laughs> might be able to work together. <laughs> How about the other side of that coin? Were there some issues that you felt like are non-starters for the legislature? I just want to be clear. I thought this was an excellent state of the state. However, I do think there will be some issues for the legislature. So I think, you know, I just took some notes. The local control for New York City, I think we talked about this in the pre-show. You know, she says she wants to provide tax incentives, which is basically 
you know, a different form of the tax abatement that expired two years. Mm -hmm. You know, eliminate density restrictions, do commercial conversions. They've been trying to do commercial conversions since I worked at the legislature. So it's an issue that's come up year after year. They can't come or they cannot be aligned in the approach. Um, and then legislating basement apartments. She did that last year and it wasn't really successful. I don't know, you know, I guess she's focusing on New York City having local control, but I still think that, I, I, I don't know if that's gonna go well. She talked about the bad cannabis players. You know, the issue with these, you know, cannabis shops all over the state, you know, they had legislation to deal with enforcement, but unless you add some type of criminal penalty to that, these people will get fined and then they will just bring the shop back up after a couple of hours. Criminal penalties are something that usually brings trepidation to the assembly, so I don't know how that works. She talks about um, graffiti and gang crimes, two additional charges. Um, I think for hate crime, I don't know how that works. There are a lot of things, I think there are a lot of great ideas, but they're tricky in terms of the legislature and I don't see, I, I just think she's going to have to negotiate. Yeah, and in terms of issues where she might run into some problems, there's also the issue that we talked about of limiting co-pays yeah. for insulin, something uh. that's been kicking around the legislature. It's moved in the Senate in the past. Uh, that version of the bill didn't pass the assembly. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got some more details on the governor's proposal uh, here, knowing now that it's limited to uh, certain plans that are regulated by, by the, the state. state. And AK. that's a small fraction of the plan. So I think that'll be interesting to see whether that has any sort of backlash. Yeah. There's also on the cannabis front, there was nothing perspective in terms of positive uh, developments uh, on the recreational market. There's clamoring for the state to address that, but nothing on that. Another area that I think is promoted more in the book that we've gotten a copy of that's mm -hmm. not part of the speech was looking to overhaul transmission projects and making it so that if we want to actually hit our green energy goals that we can develop those projects faster. Is that a big deal at the end of the day, Morgan? Oh, so uh, energy is, is actually something that I, I work in quite a bit. Um, none of the new energy that is, is set to be produced, offshore wind, for example, or any new solar, it doesn't do you any good if you can't actually get it to the places where it's going to be used. Right. So if you build massive wind farms off the coast of uh, Long Island, you actually need the transmission lines to get it to New York City. And just like it's difficult to do the siting for a big project, right, big offshore wind, project, yep. you have to do that same amount of siting for transmission lines, and all of these projects are getting bogged down in the many, many layers of bureaucracy that is New York state government to get anything approved. And it's, so it's this interesting thing where, you, you know, in one sense you do these things to protect local communities, right? You allow the local communities to have a say in whether these projects are built. You're, that's a good thing, right? On a, on a certain day, you're like, we're going we're gonna to give them a voice in this process. And people usually do that when they're talking about, I don't know, like building a garbage dump. But when suddenly you're talking about massively overhauling the, the entire way the state gets its power, and that same local community doesn't want big power lines mm -hmm. going through their open space, well, they're going to shut it down. There's, I, what I like to say about New York is there's no project that someone around here can't say no to, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter how good it is. It doesn't matter how green it is. It doesn't matter how clean it is. I promise you someone wants to say no to it. So you can't do any of the green energy stuff without re, uh, overhauling some of our trans... New York has got some of the oldest transmission lines right. in the country. If you hook it up to the offshore wind stuff, those lines will literally like catch on fire. So yeah, they need to speed up this process because they're not going to hit any of these goals if they don't do a transmission overhaul uh, to get that power into New York City, to get that power coming from upstate uh, down into the, into the city and, and coming through Long Island. And, and again, though, some of that stuff's not going to be super popular with people when they're, they're digging right. up their backyards and putting up big yeah. power lines. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, that's going to be one of the big things we get to watch with the budget, but we don't get a chance to do that today because we are out of time for today's coverage. But tune in to New York Now on Friday for additional analysis and reporting on the governor's State of the State address. My thanks to Chantel Smith of Tusk Strategies and Morgan Hook of SKDK for spending their afternoon with us. I'm David Lombardo. Thanks for watching New York Now.
Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.